worship the Lord. He's in this place. He's already here with us. I pray tonight for us as we go into worship that he would evoke a new sense of wonder for us as we sing his name, as we praise his name together. He's so good.
up today, any pressure you feel to fight, that can fall off in the name of Jesus because he's our defender. Come on. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
All right. Go ahead and find yourself a seat. We are going to get going here. Welcome, everybody. It's good to see you. Always, I love Tuesday nights. Tuesday nights are my favorite night of the week because of you guys and because we get to gather and dive into God's Word together. And um, let me start by saying this. I, um, if you hung out with me, you'd find out pretty quick. I love a great meal. Like, love a great meal. Like, it's closely related to worship, because I'm just like, God is good when I eat a good meal. Not, well, not a good meal, like a great meal. And so, um, I was just curious um, to start off tonight, because it's kind of rare that we live in a town where In-N-Out and Whataburger both exist in the same city. There's not a ton of places like that, okay? And um, there is a lot of hype about both those places. And so I would just like to get everyone on the record. Here are your choices tonight. You have to vote for In-N-Out, you have to vote for Whataburger, or you have to vote for I don't care. Okay? Those are your three options. No. I reject all other options. Okay? In-N-Out, Whataburger, I don't care. Let me see where where you guys are at. So if you're on Team In-N-Out, let me see your hand. Oh, wow. Okay. And then Team Whataburger? I think it's smaller. And then team, I don't care. That wins. The I don't care people win. <laughs> For sure. For sure. I, I like both their pla- both those places. Everyone's like, you know, do you like In-N-Out? I'm like, yeah, I like In-N-Out. Isn't it the best? And I'm like, no, it's not. Like, <laughs> it's better than McDonald's, but that's not a very high bar, you know? Um, or like I went to Whataburger for the first time uh, a couple weeks ago, and they're like, wasn't it amazing? I was like, no, it was, it was a burger. Like it's, and, and I liked the burger, but, um, but my irrational love really applies to this restaurant out in the West Coast. Every time I go out there, and I was just out in LA for a few days a couple weeks ago, and it's this place called Rubio's, guys. It is the fast food version of fish tacos. So don't, it is not some nice place, I'm saying. It is, it's fast food, but they do fish tacos. And I'm obsessed with that fish taco for some reason. I, every time I'm on the West Coast, I'm like, we gotta go to Rubio's. And, uh, and I was there with my kids, and like, I ordered the, the, the regular human-sized combo, which is two tacos. And I sat down, and I was just like, no, that's, that's not gonna do. So then I went back, and I got three more. And so I ate two and a half adult sharings worth of fish tacos at Rubio's. And one day, maybe if you've had that or if you haven't, you'll go there and you're like, I don't get it. And I'm like, that's what I'm saying. It's a rational love. Certain loves are just irrational. And Rubio's is that way. And every time I eat it, I'm like, oh, I wish I could eat this every day. And then you think about it, you're like, no, that, that actually sounds awful. But like in the moment when you're enjoying it, you're like, I could, I could eat this every day. And it made me start thinking about how um, sometimes we have like big thoughts, big concepts, and it's hard to take a big thought and, and bring it into the today into the now. So like maybe my goal was, I want to eat great food. And you're like, oh yeah, you know, that's a great goal. But like, but what do I eat next? Like, what do I do right now? What's my next meal going to be? Because I love a great meal, but I'm not a foodie. Like I don't live and breathe food. Like I have friends who are like, oh dude, you got to have this. The bone marrow is delicious. And I'm just like, that is so <laughs> disgusting. Like you are eating the marrow from the bone of a cow and like, you think it's awesome. And I tried it and it wasn't that bad, but I wasn't like, oh my gosh, I would never want to eat this regularly. And, and, and so those people like have a sense of all the food world. But for people like me, it's like, okay, so if I want to eat great food, how do I do that today? How do I make the decision today? And so that's really what we're tackling here tonight is, is, is this big concept of what it means to have new life in Jesus Christ. You know, we are made new. We go from death to life. All the things we've talked about so far, that's a big concept. But then what do I do today, if that's true? How do I have new life today? And, and that's exactly what we're talking about. The title of the message is New Life Every Day. New Life Every Day. Paul's going to help us out with this, taking a big concept and making it practical here tonight. But first, uh, let me just pray for us. <clears throat> Father, I ask that um, you would be the one teaching tonight, that your spirit would be the one illuminating, putting a spotlight on your word in such a way that our hearts can't help but see it. And may that happen here tonight. For those of us who came in and we feel distracted because there's so many different things going on in our lives, would you just help us focus right here? That for the next few minutes, we get to be with you in your presence, with your people, and in your word. 
And that's a gift, God. And so we receive that gift and thank you for it. And we ask that today would be a day we remember where we learned and got to walk in what it means to have this new life that we didn't earn it, God, but we get to receive it and enjoy it because of your grace. And we do it for your glory and pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, last week we talked about um, speaking the truth in love, which I talked about how really it's a bigger word and we got to live the truth in love. And when we live the truth in love, that's a sign of maturity in the body of Christ. That's how we're going to get to the place where we're mature. And so continuing that same topic of what do mature Christians look like, Paul's going to continue that here in chapter 4 when he says this, starting in verse 17. Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, due to the hardness, their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. Wow, that's a, that is such a charge from Paul. And when we read it in English and we say, now this I say in testifying the Lord, we don't really get that. What Paul's saying is, I really, 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 really want you to hear what I'm saying. Um, that, that's, that's the version of what he's saying. He's, pay attention. This is a lot of energy behind what I'm saying, which is this, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do. Now, when, when Paul says, you're like, Gentiles do? Wait, I thought some of the Christians were Gentiles, right? Non-Jews. So what, why is he saying, don't, don't be like the Gentiles? Well, Gentile means non-Jew, but also culturally speaking at the time, it represented the people who had rejected God. That's how they understood it. So he's saying, don't act like the people who reject God. And even if you're a Gentile and you believe in Jesus Christ, now you're grafted into the family of God. You're part of the church. We're not talking about those Gentiles. We're talking about those who have rejected God. And so what he's presenting is this idea. He's saying, hey, Christians, don't act like you're not Christians. If you're a Christian, you need to act like you're a Christian, implying the fact that sometimes Christians don't act like Christians. This happens in the church. This is still happening today. And that's why we receive this word from God through Paul, through the book of Ephesians, and say, hear this, what God says. Hey, Christians, you need to stop acting like you're not Christians. Now, what's entirely lost in the English translation of this verse is that Paul uses words um, to say that you need to stop living like the Gentiles, though I understand you won't fully be able to stop that. Okay, you can't at all see that in English. But what he's saying is, stop acting like you're not Christians if you're Christians. And, um, And even though that's what I'm telling you to do, I know that you won't fully be able to do that. And this is, um, this is something that you find all throughout the New Testament. It's the concept, a lot of times it's called the here, but not yet. And, uh, and there's many things in the kingdom of God that have to do with this, like, okay, it's here, it's real, but there's also a, a, a full version, a full extent of what God is saying that that is yet to come still. So the best example of that I could think of is the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is where God reigns, right? So we are his kingdom, and as his people, the kingdom of God is here, okay? The kingdom of God is here, literally. If, if you believe in Jesus Christ and he is your king, you are in the kingdom of God, and my life is forever different because I'm a part of the kingdom of God. So the kingdom of God is here. But then if the kingdom of God is here, then why is there war happening right now in Ukraine and Russia? Like, why all this stuff going on out there? Well, <laughs> Because the kingdom of God is not yet. The kingdom of God is still coming. And there is a day where every knee will acknowledge who the one true king is, and that's Jesus Christ, and he will establish himself upon this earth. He's coming back. Like, there's an end that's coming. And so in that sense, the kingdom of God is not yet. But don't, don't, let, that miss, don't let that be the reason why you miss out on the fact that the kingdom of God is here also. It's both those things. It's here, but it's not yet. And so in the same way, he's saying, Stop acting like as if you're not Christians, and you can do that right now, here and now, but there's also a sense where you're not going to be able to fully do that until later. And for some of us, that's like, well, then why are you telling us to do it? Well, here's the thing. 
what is to come in regards to our, you know, the spirit being at work in us, the new life of Christ that we get to experience, later on in the not yet, there's a blessing that comes with that, but there's also a blessing that comes with the here and now. And if you don't receive this word of the Lord that there is something for you to do here and now, you can, you can decide what meal to eat today. You can decide how to put into action that you have new life in Christ here and now. And if you do that, you will see a blessing that is in the here, even if it's not yet. And because Paul is, Paul is telling Christians not to act that way, that means it's possible for Christians to, to not act like they're Christians. So what he does is he shows us what life without God looks like. And he's saying this to Christians. Why? Because this is a helpful way for us to study our hearts and our lives and say, okay, so if that's what life without God looks like, then why am I? Why, am I, why, don't, why can I relate to some of the things that are being said here? And this is Paul's way of saying, don't be like this specifically in this way. So here are the three things that he mentions, putting them in, in large categories. Life without God looks like... And the first thing he says is right there where he says that they are darkened in their understanding. So life without God looks like keeping things in the dark. This is how um, if you don't know God, you have a natural disp disposition towards keeping everything in the dark. So you know, like in your heart of hearts, you know the things that God loves and he says, obey me in this way. And you know the things that God says, that's wrong. You shouldn't do that. That will hurt you. We know that. That's ingrained in our hearts. But when, when you don't know God, you just say, okay, all that stuff I need to keep under wraps. I need to keep it in the dark. And yet, and yet here we are knowing God, and we have the tendency to act like people who don't know God. And, and when we fail, we have this temptation. We say, we're going to keep it all in the dark. So keeping it all in the dark means I literally want no other person ever to know. Now, the call of the Christian is not the opposite. The opposite of keeping in the dark is not like, hey, let's set up a microphone and everybody come up here and just tell us all the things you've committed in your life. That's not the opposite of keeping in the dark. Bringing it into the light biblically is when you confess your sin one to another. Okay, this is why it's one to another. I'm not telling you guys, you have, everyone has to know everything you've ever done, but someone needs to hear one of your brothers, one of your sisters, confess your sins one to another. Why? Is it their job to forgive you? No, they're not going to forgive you. God's going to forgive you. God is the one who forgives. But when you confess it one to another, you receive the healing. Because you get to experience seeing someone who loves you say, hey, I'm with you. And I'm, I'm, I have my failures too. And when you bring that into the light, that's the place where God works. So it's, it's like, as Christians, we're like, I don't like that idea. So then we jump over to acting like we're not Christian. And we say, we're going to keep it in the dark. I'm going to do everything to control the narrative. I'm going to do everything to make sure that I control the consequences of my actions. And, and you're going to find out it doesn't work out that way, guys. That's why the call of the Christian is, is bring it into the light. We're going to talk about this later, um, walking in the light. That's why it's such a beautiful picture. So that's the first thing, what life without God looks like. Second thing is that really there's an effort towards running away from God when you, when you want to live life without him. So when your failures show up, when you commit a sin, it's, it's, I want nothing to do with God. I want to hide from God. This is what Adam and Eve did when they committed sin. It's like they go hiding as if they can hide from God, as if you and I can hide from God. No one can hide from God. He's, wherever we go, he's there, but we run away by spending less time with him, by spending less time with his people, by spending less time in worship, and yet the call of those who, of us who are life with God is the exact opposite. It's, hey, when we fail, we all have that urge to be like, you know what, I just wanna, I just wanna peace out. I want more distance between me and God. And what Paul's saying is, no, don't do that. Do the opposite. Come near to God, even in your failure. Yes. You have no idea what's waiting for you when the father is waiting for the prodigal son. He's looking from afar. That's God, okay? He's not the God who's, who's waiting with a you know, baseball bat to be like, I can't wait till I come home. No, he's the father who's, who's broken over what's happened. And he's the one grieving over what's happened. He's ready. He's waiting to receive. So we run to God, but yet we have this tendency still to run away from God as if we're living life without him. And then the third thing that life without God looks like, and this honestly is the scariest one, it looks like a callous heart. It looks like a callous heart. The reason why this one's so scary is because of the language that's presented to us inside the passage. 
that they've calloused themselves, they've given themselves over to sin. And the thing about calluses is um, you lose the ability to feel at that point. So that's, I mean, we all know what calluses are. I, I remember this past fall uh, with New Life Worship, we, uh, we recorded that album, right? And so they, they asked me to play Electric 2, Danny, you know, Danny Slade on Electric 1. I was, so I'm like backup support position. But it's been a long time since I played electric guitar. I mostly play keyboard. And, uh, and, and the electric guitar, the strings are much thinner. They're much sharper. And so I start like going through rehearsals after not playing electric guitar for a long time. And guess what happens? Like my skin just starts splitting. And so like I have all these like little cuts on my fingers as I go through rehearsals. And then, I mean, there's no option. You just tough through it. And what happens is your skin starts healing over it. And then it gets harder. And then now I was able to play on recording night. And it didn't hurt me to play because my skin had gotten thick enough. So the callousness means you stop feeling the grief. You start feeling, stop feeling the pain. And, and you know someone is far from God when they can just blatantly live against what God has said is right and just and good. And they're like, and? That's a callous heart. It, it's not, it, you're like, man, if I did that, I'd feel terrible. And you're like, yeah, that's a good sign. It's a good sign that you would be grieved over those actions. But if, if you live life apart from God, you get callous. And here's why this is so dangerous, guys. If you stop feeling the pain, how do you know when, when to turn around or what to turn to? You just, you lose your compass is what happens. And sadly, there are Christians who also seek to callous their hearts. And, and they, they, they commit a sin, then they sense the presence of God and that godly grief, which is what Paul uses the term, godly grief is a good thing. When you sin and you're like, I can't believe I did that, that grieves my heart that I sinned against God and I sinned against other people. That's healthy. That's not a bad thing. What's bad is shame. It's when you start adding all these other things and saying like, you know, things aren't even, aren't even true about you because you want to self-inflict pain. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the natural response of just grieving, just being sad that I sinned against God. And, and that's godly grief. And, and if, if you feel that, that's a good sign. I can't tell you the amount of times I've sat down with someone and they are just broken over something that happened in their lives whether something around them or something they did. And, and normally the first thing I say is, look, I know it doesn't sound like good news, but it is good news that you feel the way you feel. Because I've also had conversations with people where I'm confronting, I'm saying, how could, you know, how could this be? This is not right. This is not right in the eyes of God, and I have to confront. And then the person's like, I, I don't, there's nothing wrong here. You're making it up. That's a cow's heart. And if there's anyone who, if you've been living a life that's led you more towards cows and you're like, you know what, I feel like the voice has turned into a whisper, has turned into a whisper I hear every two weeks, anything like that, that's really, really dangerous territory. And the encouragement is don't do that anymore and repent and here's what God says, I'm, I'm ready, I'm here, I'm waiting and maybe that could be tonight for some of you guys that you've been going down this path of a cow's heart, and tonight could be the night where you say, no more, no more, God. I want to feel and experience godly grief that leads to salvation. So this is the warning Paul gives us. He says, life without God looks like this, but it's not all bad news. Here comes the good news. Verse 20 through 24, he says this. But that is not the way you learned Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him, um, again, assuming is maybe the better word is like because you've heard of him, he's referencing the fact that Paul's the guy who taught them Christ, okay? He's saying, remember, I'm the one who taught you about Jesus Christ, and as the truth is in Jesus, then he gives us this, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. The end result is true righteousness and holiness in the likeness of God that our actions really do start to change as Christians, as you mature as a Christian. There really is a difference in your life, okay? This does happen and um, now, before we get to this picture of putting, you know, putting off the old self, putting on the new self, I just got to deal with an important point here in verse 23 because 
Uh, verse 23 in my version of the Bible, which is the ESV, it says, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, which I give that translation an F plus for sure. Um, and here's why. Uh, they, it, it gives you the idea of, and being renewed in the spirit of your minds, meaning what's happening in here has to be renewed by you. And I absolutely don't think that's what is in the passage. Two reasons why I believe. Here's what I believe the verse says. The verse says, and to be renewed in your minds by the Holy Spirit. That's what's being said. And two reasons why that's being said. One, every other time we talk about the Spirit in Ephesians, it's the Holy Spirit. Why in the world would we assume this one's the exception? The reason translators assume it's an exception is because the wording's slightly different. But the the second reason, which is just like the nail in the coffin for me, is that it, he uses a passive verb. And by using a passive verb, what Paul is saying is that the renewing of your mind does not happen by your doing. It happens by an external agent. And who in the world is gonna renew your mind if not you? It's gonna be the Holy Spirit. So it makes absolutely perfect sense to say when he says the spirit of the mind, it's not of as belonging to, the spirit in your mind, the spirit in the territory of your mind, which is the Holy Spirit, God himself is the one who's gonna renew your mind. Now, this one's a big deal to me, okay? This translation is a big deal, why? Because if the Holy Spirit's not involved, then this whole passage is just telling you, do this, do this, do this. This is such a danger. Pastors can grab this passage and preach it to you like performance, like you need to do this and you need to stop doing that and you need to do this. And if you skip the, what verse 23 is saying, which is you have a part to play but then the spirit has to do it, okay? It's not just you have to stop doing this, do this. This is such a temptation of our generation that we put on ourselves in Christianity, we think it's just try harder, Eddie. Just try harder. You're failing as a Christian. Look at all the things you're doing. You're failing. Just try harder. That's performance Christianity, and Jesus died so that you wouldn't have to live that life of performance. It's not by works so that no one can boast, so that I can say, I tried harder than you, and I tried harder than you, so I'm a better Christian. No, 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 that's not how it works. It's not try harder, but it is an invitation to partner more with God. Partner more with God. It's not just muster up some more strength to do better. It's learn what it means to partner with the Holy Spirit in the renewing of your mind, which we're about to get to. Learn how that partnership looks and then just do that more. And the more you do that, the more you will mature. And the more this big concept of like, I have new life in Christ, will start to get real. It will get real today. It could get real right here tonight. And that partnership is illustrated by Paul with the picture of clothing. Clothing, when he says put on, (laughs) that's like referencing a cloak, like put on a coat, take off your coat. Put on clothing, take off clothing. So now um, I turn our attention to why I have this, you know, uh, rack of this sort of closet of clothing is for this illustration. So all of you who are like, man, he's gonna sell us merch at the end of the sermon. No, that's not the plan. That's not the plan, I promise. (laughs) Though this is nice merch. (laughs) Um, Okay, so here we have our NOYA shirt, and uh, I just thought this would be the easiest uh, way of illustrating it. So we have two options. We have light, we have darkness, and not to hate on darkness, I mean, look, I'm wearing all black. I love black, I love wearing black. It's a very, very, very favorite color of mine to wear. But but for our illustrations, we're saying, you you can put on this or you can put on that. And um, and there is, there is a very different um, option given to us as Christians. So we have the choice. We have the choice, but the Spirit is the only one who can change it. So let, let me throw this up on the screen. This is, I want to be very clear. It's your choice what to put on, but only the Spirit can transform your mind. So this is a partnership. Remember I talked about, I want to partner more with God. That's how I'm going to have new life in Christ. Here's how it happens. You have a choice of are you gonna wear this or are you gonna wear this today? But even if you choose the right thing, there's nothing that changes in your life without the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit changes you when you choose this. That's how it works, okay? So, um, so here's all the things that were inside the passage described to us about what life without God looks like and then we're drawing the conclusion of what, God, what life with God would be. So we talked about 
if I choose my way, then I'm gonna keep things in the dark, right? And, and, and when I keep things in the dark, that's me saying, I wanna wear this today, okay? I'm gonna keep things in the dark. God says, you get to walk in the light. <laughs> you get to confess to one another. You get to experience what it's like to live life in the light. Life in the darkness is, is isolation. Life in the darkness is confusion. And God's saying, no, no, come here. Come live in the light. Walk in the light with me. Then we also say, um, well, when I, I want to run from God. I want to live far from God if I wear this. And you have that choice. You can wear that too. You can run. You can run. You can say, I want less to do with God. I don't want to be near God. But God's saying, hey, draw near to me. And in the book of James, he says, draw near to me. And you know what I'll do? I'll draw near to you. Come closer. Don't run far. Come closer. And then we say, you know, if I wear this, well, then I can give myself to whatever sin I want. But the problem is sin makes a callous heart, like we've talked about. And then on this, if I wear this, I realize that I'm still going to mess up. Like on this side of the wardrobe is not perfection, guys. It's not I never mess up. No, it's when I fail, when I sin. The book of Acts says that times of refreshing come through repentance. And if you've ever experienced when you fail and you bring it in the process that God calls repentance, which is the changing of your mind, that's the renewing of your mind. That's when you say, I thought that was awesome and now I realize how it grieves the heart of God and I want nothing to do with it. When you experience that truly, you get to experience a refreshment in your soul. It, it really is like water in the desert. It's one of the most beautiful things that we get to experience as Christians when we repent. And then I just added this one. This one's not in the text, but I just wanted to give you a summary phrase because at the end of the day, what we're saying is you can wear the thing that says, I want what I want, or you can wear the, the, the thing that says, I want what God wants. And that, that, that simple change will change everything for you in regards to your life in Christ. This is a tension. <laughs> I... I want what I want. So you can get up in the morning and be like, I want what I want. So I could wear this, right? And if you want what you want, this is what you have ahead of you today, okay? And that's your choice. This is what's gonna happen. But if you say, you know what? Today, I want what God wants. So I'm gonna put this on. And, and, and that doesn't mean I'm gonna be perfect. That doesn't mean I'm gonna crush it, right? It's the here but not yet. I know there's still gonna be failure involved, but man, this looks really awesome. And I'm going to choose to wear this. Now, if the picture is given to us of clothing, and you've heard me say this before, every time an illustration is given in scripture, you can trust that that illustration is the best illustration to understand what God's trying to say. I don't have to give you some other version modernized. No, this is a fantastic picture. Here's why. When do we get dressed? Every day. You don't just pick an outfit and live in that outfit for the rest of your life. You get dressed every day. So here's the picture I want you to think of. You wake up every single morning. And honestly, what's true? <laughs> you wake up and you're already wearing this. You wake up and you say, okay, what's the day hold? And you look down and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm already wearing the black hoodie. <laughs> and, and But when you see that you woke up wearing it, you have a choice. And you can say, okay, I choose... I'm not going to wear this today. I'm going to put this back on the rack. And I'm going to wear this today. And you put that on. And that choice invites the partnership of the Holy Spirit. When you say, I choose, God, I, I reject this and I choose this today, you're inviting the presence of the Holy Spirit. He'll start renewing your mind. Okay, now, I'm going to be really honest with how life in Christ has been for me. There are days where I say, I don't want to wear this. I'm going to wear this today. And then I put it on. And then I go about my day and I'm like, I, I want what God wants. And then I get to like, I don't know, 10 a.m. the same day. And I look down and I'm like, I'm wearing the black hoodie again. Like, what happened? I don't, I don't even remember going back to my closet to change and take off the white shirt and put on the black hoodie. If you, if you can relate to that, I'm telling you, this is why it's not yet. And this is why we're, we're working out our salvation is the, is the language Paul used. What does that mean? Does that mean we're earning our salvation? No, no, no. You're living out your salvation. And, and there's, there's fear and there's trembling and there's, there's striving in the sense that this is a conflict for me, but I am called into it. And God's not calling you into it to be alone and just saying, just pick the right thing. He's saying, look, every time you put this on, 
I'll be right there. And the more time you spend wearing this, the more I'm gonna change the way you think. And I can give testimony to you guys that the longer I've worn this white shirt, the less appealing that black hoodie's become to me. And that did not happen fast. So there's people who are like, great, I put on the white shirt, but I don't feel any different. I'm like, yeah, you just finally put it on and the Holy Spirit's like, just getting to work in you and you're, you're upset that you don't see things different. Give it time. Let the, let the, if he planted a seed in you, give it time to grow. Let it water it. Give more of it. And, and so much of the Christian life is this choice over and over and over again. And if you get to the point where you're like, I'm just so sick of this black hoodie, I'm telling you that's a good sign. That's not a sign of failure. That's a sign that the Spirit's really renewing your mind. Because the world, they look at that black hoodie and they say, give me more. I want more of that one. Let's, let's sell that on television. Let's, let's mass produce that. And, and if you can get to the point where you're like, you know what, that's, that's not what I want anymore. You're already on your way. You're already on your way to what new life in Christ is. So my encouragement to you is think about that every day. And on the days where you look down, you're like, man, I, don't, I did not wanna wear this. Praise God that you see it. Because once you see it, now you can choose it. If, the, if, the, if Satan can keep you in the dark, then you never know what you're wearing. You can't see your black hoodie. And he's so happy because he's like, everyone's wearing black hoodies and they're, you know, they're living the Christian life, but they've given in to what I want because they're in the dark. But if God can bring you into the light and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm wearing this black hoodie, praise God you can see it. Because now you have the choice. And this is what I'm trying to present to you. Each one of you has a choice and your choice is what do I put on today? But your choice is not do I have the power to change? You don't have the power to change. Only the Holy Spirit can change you. That's why inside this passage, when we ended chapter three, we talked about how we need the power of the Holy Spirit to do this. And hear Paul's heart, even as he shares it with these Christians in Ephesus. It's covered with the presence of the Holy Spirit as we live out the Christian life. And if you have an idea of the Christian life being, I just have to do it myself, you're missing out on it altogether. It's a partnership. It's not try harder. It's how can I partner more with God? So I told you I wanted to help you with bringing this from big concept to the practical. Um, so let's do that now. There are two note cards under your seat. Go ahead and grab those. And there's a pen. And I'm gonna walk you through an exercise of how we can put this in practice as we follow the Jesus way like we sang about tonight. Two note cards and a pen. And here's what we're gonna do. First thing, I'm gonna do this with you. Uh, the first thing I want, to, I want you to do is take the first note card and at the top of it, write the word old and then your first name. So for me, it's old Eddie. Remember, this is old as in the past, not old as in age. Past Eddie, old Eddie. Okay. Now you've written old and then your name. So mine says old Eddie. Now here's what I want you to do. Just fold it inward in half. Because I'm going to ask you to be really, really honest with yourself right now before God. And I'm not asking you to be really, really honest with anyone else. So we're folding it because I don't want anyone looking at anything else. This is a place where we're gonna have a space where we're gonna be honest with God. And here's what I'm gonna encourage you to write. You're gonna write what old you struggles with. And I promise, no one's gonna read this. We're, we're, you're not even gonna have this by the end of the night. We're gonna get rid of them, it's all good. But you're gonna write down, let's just acknowledge, let's be honest, old this, old me, struggles with, and struggles with is, is gracious terminology because we're not trying to make anyone feel more terrible about anything. We're trying to say, here's the reality of old me. Old me struggles with this. So I'll give you guys examples, and they're not personal examples, again, because I get to write these things between me and God, and you're gonna get the same privilege. But I'm just gonna give you some examples, like be honest with God. Old me struggles with honesty. I would rather get away with my way, and I'll lie to get out of it. That's, that's old me. Or old me struggles with loneliness, and I'm willing to compromise my beliefs in order to gain a relationship. Old me struggles with greed. I'd, I'd do anything for more. 
I love getting more, more time, more people, more whatever, more employees, more money, whatever you want. I have that, I have that inside of me. That's the old me. So, um, like I said, we're gonna keep this between you and the Lord, but take a minute here and just be honest and just write one, two, three things. Just say, old me struggles with, just bullet points, struggles with that. Go ahead and take a, take a minute and write some of those down. When you're done, you just fold it in half, like I said. And just hold that in your hand. You keep it. All right, second card. No surprises here. Write the word new and write your first name. New me. And here's what I want you to write. I want you to write in faith what God has called you to be. It doesn't mean you've achieved it. It means God has called you to be that. So just one example is if, you know, if old me struggled with honesty and I lied to get my way, then new me is called to the truth found in Jesus Christ. And however you want to word it, again, I'm not trying to dictate exactly what you're supposed to write. I'm trying to say, if that's the old you, now in faith, what is it that God's calling you to be? What does that look like? What is new you supposed to look like? New me, and then just write one or two things down. New me looks like this. New me does this. New me is like this. New me is going to break the chains of generational sin. Or new me is going to believe that God created sexuality in the best way, his way. New me is going to be a good friend to others. Whatever it is, write that down.
<clears throat> All right, so you have this folded card, the old you, hold that in one hand, and then you have the new you in the other hand. And here, here's what I wanna to present to you guys. Uh, sometimes when people think of the ministry of the Holy Spirit, they think of experiences or specific things that what you think the Holy Spirit's ministry is. And um, we do this exercise for you to see that I did not tell you what to write down on the new you card, but you wrote something down. And if you wrote things that come from God's word that he wants for you, you just experience the renewing of your mind right now. That's what it is. It's I see things differently. How did you see that? Because Eddie told you to write? No, you saw it because the Holy Spirit did a work in your heart. He did a work in your mind. All you did is you said, I'll be the one writing things down. I'll partner with him and I'll, I'll agree with him. And then look at what he just helped you write down right there on the new card. So we're going to take off the old and we're gonna put on the new. And we have to do this every day. So like I said, you're not gonna leave with this old card. So here in a second, the worship team's gonna lead us. We're gonna be singing a song and then at any point during the song, whenever you want, whenever you're ready, you go ahead and rip this one up. I'm gonna bring a trash, trash can over that I have ready. I'll bring it here to the center. You just drop it in there. And I promise no one will try to put your card back together, okay? <laughs> promise. Um, so you, you do that as we sing this next worship song whenever you're ready. And then here's what I want you to do with a new card. This is what you put before yourself every single day, okay? So put this up in your closet maybe. That'd be a pretty cool place to put so that every time you get dressed, you're like, this is what I'm choosing. I'm choosing this today, God, and may it be through the power of your spirit that I can actually live this out today. And if halfway through the day you're like, I didn't do it, then say, God, I choose it again. And I come back to this. And if at night you're still not wearing it, you say, God, I choose it again. You have to put this before you because this choice is new life every day. Every single day, it's our commitment to follow Jesus. The way of Jesus is you die to yourself, you pick up your cross and you follow him and that happens every single day. So we're gonna commit to that. We're gonna destroy this and then put this, maybe, maybe it's in your closet, maybe it's on the mirror in your bathroom, maybe it's on the dashboard of your car. And, and you keep it as long as it's useful. I'm not gonna give you guys rules or anything. I'm just saying, for a while, like, put this in front of you and, and let's just see what God has planned um, as we say, this is who God has called me to be and I'm gonna choose it and I'm gonna ask that through the power of the Holy Spirit, I might be able to live that out. All right, I'm gonna get the trash can. Worship team, you guys lead us.
looks like tonight. That's today. That's every day. And that's what we're going to try to step into. Um, I just wanted to, I just wanted to end tonight because we just saw the work of the Lord. And anytime God works, he's worthy of a response. And so I, I just, we just want, I just want to sing that bridge again. We don't have to build it up or anything. I, can we just let this be our thankfulness to God? Whatever happened here tonight, whatever happened here in your heart, whatever happened here in your mind, he's the one we should be praising. He's the one we should be thanking. So let's just sing that bridge. Praise the Savior. He has risen. We are born again. Sing. Praise the Savior. Father, where would we be without you? We'd still be dead in our trespasses. We'd still be in chapter one and two of this book. But you're the one calling us out of that and saying we're to walk in a manner worthy of which we've been called. And so God, we just say thank you. Thank you that you didn't leave us alone to do that. Thank you that you're working in us and through us to the praise of your glory. So God, I pray a prayer of consecration, meaning that we dedicate these times where we see this card that we've written tonight. We dedicate those moments to be holy moments. We say in that moment where our eye catches that card, would your spirit just speak to us and invite us into partnership with him? that we would say yes, and for the times we say no, that we would come back to you and continue coming back to you. For we know that you invite us into something that's here, but not yet. But just because it's not yet doesn't mean we don't get to have the blessing of the here. So I pray the blessing of the here over every single person in this room. God, as they step out in faith and they say, I will live this out, I will put on the new self, God, I pray a blessing over them, that they would see what you're doing in their lives as soon as they do that. And we ask for your power and your presence. And it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. And everybody here said, amen, amen. That's awesome. Can we just give God a little bit of praise here in this place? Thank you, Lord. Yes, Lord. And that right there is why Tuesday nights is my favorite night of the week. And uh, I'm so glad you guys were able to join us. We got a few minutes. Make sure you hang out. Meet someone new. If you feel like you don't know people, just take that step and be like, hey, I want to meet someone. And if it doesn't go great, come up front and meet me and Christina. We're really nice people, guys. Okay? Uh, And if you're visiting and you haven't been around and haven't had a chance to meet me or Christina, we'd love to meet you tonight. So please come up front. I would love to uh, just get to know your name and kind of hear a little bit about your story. So... All right, that's all we have. I will see you guys next Tuesday night right here, 7 o'clock. See you then.